The Soybean School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Pride Seeds, Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans, High Stick NT, and the Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Pro. We're back at the Southwest Ag Conference here down near Richtown. I'm joined by Dr. Ross Bender of the Mosaic Company. Welcome, sir, to uh, Soybean School. Thank you, sir. It's an honor to be here. I'm glad to uh, have the chance to work with some of the Ontario's best farmers. Awesome. Hey, you've uh, just finished your presentation, Maximum Soybeans, Six Secrets of Soybean Success. Yes, I just sir. thought we take a couple of minutes and run through some of those and then sort of skim along at around 30,000 feet and Excellent. Touch, touch on some of those. Um, Number one is yes. always the weather, right. right? Rain in August, right? right. Yep. No, that's that's critical. Just be have, because you have a good yield in one crop, such as corn, for example, it doesn't guarantee you're going to have a good yield in another crop like soybean. Inherently, the weather needed to produce maximum corn yields is probably not exactly the same as soybean, and for that reason, soybean loves uh, uh, loves the precipitation in August and can tolerate probably some of those warmer nights, unlike corn would be able to. Yeah. Uh, number two on your list, I'll fertility, yes. and uh, you made the point out the fact that, you know, in the U.S., um, about 80% of farmers are not fertilizing soybeans the way they should. Right. No, that's exactly right. So there's there's two actually reasons why we listed fertilization as a second secret of soybean success. Uh, the first reason is because most farmers um, have the perception that it's not needed or they don't fertilize it. Um, as you mentioned, 80% of producers do not fertilize P or K before their soybean crop. Um, and, but the second reason why we listed number two as, a, as the second secret of soybean success is because uh, maybe we're not giving enough attention to some of the other nutrients that are really important in producing the seed. That nutrient uh, I brought up is is phosphate. It's real critical in producing some of the compounds that are needed to, to have a healthy seed yield. Yeah. And you talk, obviously you talked about sulfur and you know making making sure that there's enough nutrition nutrients available late right. in the season. Yeah so season long uh, crop nutrition or balanced crop nutrition is critical for soybean uh, and even corn. That concept holds for corn more so today than ever before. The higher yields that we grow and the varieties and cultivars and hybrids that we use today have a higher yield potential now than ever before. And when is that yield created? It's truly created at the back half of the growing season. And when that dry matter or that grain is being produced, it needs to have an adequate or non-limiting supply of nutrition. And for soybean, those, uh, some of those critical nutrients are phosphate, sulfur, uh, nitrogen, and zinc. Um, number three on your list, genetics and varieties. Obviously, yes. they're, they're not all created the same. And you did some interesting research that really showed you right. if you take a, a group of really good, you know, uh, soybean varieties and test them. Yep. Um, vast difference. That's right. And contrary to the popular belief, not all soybean varieties are created equal, and therefore, not all of them. Um, not not only do not have the same yield potential, but they also respond to management differently as well. And even if you give all soybean varieties the same intensive management, they're not all going to yield the same, which means that that decision that a producer makes has real life implications. You need to, pick, uh, to pick the right variety for your particular operation when that fits your system well and you'll receive the maximum ROI on that decision. Number four on the list, uh, foliar protection. And it's an interesting conversation about foliar protection because yes. it's really about pods and seed yep. and heavier seeds, right? Yes. Yep. No, that's exactly right. And in the case of soybean, you can calculate soybean. If you boil it down, there's three, three key components. Pods per plant, uh, the number of seeds in each pod, and the weight of each soybean seed. Uh, foliar protection helps to maximize the last of those three pieces in that equation, seed, uh, seed weight. Uh, by, by applying a foliar fungicide, not only do you protect that soybean leaf from, from diseases and, and with an insecticide you protect it from insects, you help to keep the plant's uh, so-called lights on for longer, capturing sunlight and using it and converting it into um, biomass and yield. Right, so um, one pod per plant equals? Two bushel an acre, exactly. I want to talk, you talked a little bit about seed treatments and I think we really understand the need to sort of, you know, protect that plant and, you know, and, 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 and make it a, a, a strong stand. I want to yes. go on to your final, number six, yep. row spacing, um, you know, 20 versus 30 inches rows, you know, uh, intercepting light, you know, getting more plants. Yes. Um, and you had a, some, an interesting uh, approach on, you know, basically, you know, if you're going to grow narrow rows, you need to manage them. Right. Yeah, the, the, the whole concept of row configuration or row spacing is, is a difficult one from a producer standpoint because <clears throat> 
there's a very large capital investment initially. But after that capital investment, there's essentially no additional cost of using narrower rows relative to the wider rows. But uh, the advantage of some of the narrow rows is that you do have the opportunity to intercept more light, convert that into biomass into the plant, so that plant then has additional resources to capture sunlight and convert that into yield by the end of the growing season. So. I'll admit that's a very, very difficult conversation to have, uh, and it's a producer by producer uh, decision. But we, we like the opportunities, especially in climates where you have a short growing season, like such as Ontario. Yeah, yeah, and you did some research that you know you basically looked at um, you know uh, how that how that works across different you know uh, exactly latitudes, and you know and you focused on DeKalb, Illinois, which is pretty similar yep. to uh, to Ridgetown. What, what did you find when you sort of you did? Yeah, that? so we had we had three locations that we, we we evaluated different row configurations in their row spacings, and and the two most northern locations had the greatest response to the narrower rows. The row spacings we used were 30 inch rows, and we compared them to to 20 inch rows. And 20 inch rows always had higher yield potential and higher overall yield. And the greatest responses occurred in, in, in northern climates, such as DeKalb, which is the same latitude perspective. What about, talk about that intensive management. I mean, like as you said, if you're going to go narrow rows, yep. you, you've got to. Yes. Take that approach. Yeah, thank you. So, so row spacing is not a silver bullet approach. You cannot just do one thing. You cannot change management, one management practice and expect a significantly increased yield. It really is a systems approach to, to agronomic management and soybean, and row spacing is one of those tools. Um, if you're going to uh, narrow, use a different row configuration, such as a narrower row spacing, in order to get the most value out of it, you might want to consider additional agronomic management that complements it. Um, and, and, and along those same lines, if you're going to give your soybean plants additional management to really re, um, achieve the full value out of that management, you also should consider narrower row spacing. So there's an interaction, they go together well, and to get the most bang out of either one of those resources or those investments, you should do both. <laughs>